I'm going to start by reading um, from the Gospel, from John chapter 10, starting at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. When the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it, the man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, back to Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is perhaps the best known and perhaps the best loved psalm. It's found its way into our culture. Perhaps more than anything else in the Bible. And it's certainly one of the very few parts of the Bible that I'd come across before I became interested in Christianity. I first came across it in the words were used in the film War of the Words, a 1953 film which I watched when I was probably about 10 or 11 on the telly, where the priest recites this psalm as he goes out to defy the Martian fighting machines. And it was obvious even to a young boy that he would not survive. But what was much less obvious was the impact that these words would have and have had in our time. It's been used in many films. In The Elephant Man, Merrick quotes it to show his intelligence. In Titanic, it's recited as the ship sinks. In Van Helsing, it's quoted by a monster. Part of it is used in Terminator Salvation, where it's read to someone who's about to be executed. It's recited in the Book of Eli, perhaps not surprisingly, and also in the remake of True Grit, and in the 2011 film, War Horse. Those are just a few. The list is huge. Most of those times, the words are used to give comfort to those who are facing their final journey, the journey into death. But that's not the only use that's made of the psalm. To have captured our imagination like this means it must have some important messages for us. So this morning we're going to look at what the message of the psalm really is and try to gain a sense of the relationship that its author has with the Lord God. The psalm starts with a metaphor. The Lord is my shepherd. Shepherd was a common metaphor for a king in the area at the time. This understanding was not restricted to the Jews. It appears also in the Code of Hammurabi, from ancient Babylonia, about 1772 BC. The metaphor was used in King David's calling in 2 Samuel 5.2, where the tribes of Israel have come together to make King David king. And they say, In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. Psalm 23 is David's personal expression of his relationship with God. In the line, the Lord is my shepherd, the emphasis is on my. The psalm goes on in the first person, I shall not want, as David describes what the shepherd does for him. This personal relationship with God Sorry. I'll cough the other way next time. This personal relationship with God is one of the things that makes the psalm so appealing to us. All David's needs are provided. He makes me lie down in green pasture. Sheep normally have to stand and wander around and keep on the move to eat because they eat so much grass. They have to be moved from pasture to pasture because pasture is good in the winter in some places and then in the summer it dries up and you have to move the sheep somewhere else where there is more grass. But the shepherd provides grass that is readily available and plenty of it. 
There is no need to move on. The sheep can remain in one place. They can even rest. The Lord provides everything that David needs. He does not have to be concerned about where and how his needs will be met. He leads me beside quiet waters. I'm sure you've all watched natural history programs where the watering hole is the most interesting part of the program. Watering holes are dangerous places. Predators know that the prey has to come to drink. All animals have to come to a watering hole eventually to drink. But the Lord provides quiet waters where there are not predators. A place of safety where our life cannot suddenly be taken without warning. In verse 3, we take a quick break from the sheep metaphor as David recognizes that sheep and people are really quite different in many ways and that our needs are quite different from theirs. And he says, he restores my soul. This is not a spiritual message. This is an entirely practical message. The Lord gives us back a sense of joy and enthusiasm so that we may live our life to the full. A theme that Jesus picks up in John 10.10 10, when he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The shepherd guides the sheep down the right paths. They may not be the easiest paths, but they are the best way to get to the fresh grass and the quiet waters. He does it not only because he loves them and cares for them, but for his sake too. Some of these paths may be dark. There are valleys in Israel that only receive sun for a few minutes in the day around noon because the sides are so steep and so high. But David understood that it was what a shepherd may have to do. The shepherd knows where there is good pasture and he knows how to get there. He has prepared the way, we might say, and has gone before us. Even when we go through the darkest valley, we are not afraid, because we have already seen what the shepherd has done for us. So as long as we know the shepherd is there, there is nothing to fear. His protection is all we need. The phrase, the valley of the shadow of death is an evocative phrase and perhaps one of the reasons the psalm is so quotable in our modern age. It reminds us of our mortality and that we have a saviour that will rescue us even from that final evil. Unfortunately it is not a particularly good translation and the later NIVs say darkest valley which is much closer to the sense of what is written. So even in the darkest valley, we will fear no evil because our shepherd has come prepared for trouble. He has his rod and his staff, a weapon for protection against wild animals and a walking staff to help him across difficult terrain and to guide the sheep. My prop. This was given to me in Tanzania. It's not Israeli. They take this with them when they go on a long walking trip. Now in Tanzania there aren't wolves and bears anymore because there are so many people, the wolves and bears have been driven away. So they take this for protection against criminals. But that's the sort of thing, that's the sort of thing that David would have walked around with. Something that he could have a really good strike on a bear with, because you have to hit bears pretty hard if you're going to damage them, or to keep wolves at bay. And then the staff is like one of our staffs over there, only a bit more meaty. And it's used to guide the sheep and to help the shepherd walk across rough terrain. So the shepherd is prepared, and he's prepared for trouble. So the weapons are there to help. They're not going to be used against the sheep. They're going to be used to protect the sheep. So they, the fact that the shepherd has them, 
provides additional comfort. In verses 5 and 6, the metaphor of the shepherd is abandoned and the imagery changes. We are at a feast at which David is the honoured guest. We know he's the honoured guest because anointing was reserved for the honoured guest. And he is anointed with scented olive oil. His cup runs over. There is no sense here of the, please sir, can I have some more that you get in Oliver? There is more than enough here. The provision of God is not adequate, it's abundant. The cup overflows, mainly because there is too much in it. So you've ever walked a cup of coffee across the room when you overfilled it? That's the sort of thing we're talking about. All of this is done for David in the presence of his enemies. It underlines God's love for David. It shows David how special he is. So the final verse should not come as a surprise. This is how God looks after him. He is secure in knowing that goodness and love will be with him all of his life. And there is no reason to leave the presence of the Lord. As Christians, it's impossible to read this psalm and not recognize the promises of Jesus in it. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, the subject of our psalm. Jesus, though, goes one step further and promises to lay down his life for the sheep. It is through his death and resurrection that we know him and experience for ourselves all that the psalmist has to say about him. David is expressing his confidence in God's goodness in this world and in the next. He recognizes God's provision, protection and preparation in a very personal way. It is this confidence in God that gives the psalm its appeal, especially for those who have to confront difficult times in their lives. As one commentator says of this psalm, it is for parents who survive the folly of rebellious children, for people returning from war, and for those who are just out of jail. Jesus is the good shepherd described by David in this psalm, one in whom we can place our confidence, one who will provide for us, protect us through our darkest experiences, and who has gone ahead of us into the most difficult things we will have to face in the future.